This is Karen Martell from the Hormone Solution Podcast. And this is Natalie Nidham from the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. And this is Danny Hamilton from the Unlock the Sugar Shackles Podcast. And, and this is our to, round table. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's more of a triangle, but it is a round table. <laughs> if we were held hands. <laughs> yeah. So we were t- all together, the three of us ladies, down in Sarasota, Florida, for a second time last year. Um, we were speaking down with uh, Dr. John Lawrence at uh, the Women's Health Summit last July. And then we were at the elements of vitality summit in December and getting to all together you should I mean if there was a little fly on the wall watching us it would be laughing hysterically the entire time because we don't shut up (laughs) when we're together it is four days solid of non-stop chatter and it's just like because we're finally around like-minded people we love each other to death we support each other in all aspects we're all podcasters all into the health and nutrition space and we come up with a lot of great ideas where it's like we sit there and brainstorm for four days and so one night we're sitting around and in our airbnb late late at night and decided we start talking actually about all the things that kind of piss us off (laughs) that is out there in the health space that we're always seeing on social media or you know things that people are saying that we're just like ah don't say that (laughs) and so we start talking about all of our pet peeves yeah yeah misconceptions and pet peeves and we decided wait a second this could be a really good podcast episode so hence this is why we are doing today's round table so that we can bring you guys kind of a behind the scenes look at what we talk about and some of the misconceptions that we would like to clear up for everybody so that you can get some straight answers. Awesome. Let's do it. One of our topics, which is, um, we discussed this, the peptide use and, you know, peptides are becoming all the rage and they're super popular. And I've got a group about peptides for the weight loss peptides. You've got an amazing group for the pep for just peptides in general. Uh, that's very successful. And you're really trying to educate people on the use of peptides. Uh, But, and I'm sure you've seen this too in both your Facebook group and your private group. And I see it in my weight loss group, which is people going, Ooh, have you guys heard about this company? They're so cheap. The peptides, I'm going to get it from them. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's like, it's a, and I've had to take down posts and then like, you know, gently reach out to that person and say, we don't actually allow for that because there's so many scams right now on the internet that, and this is something that you are injecting into your body or, you know, doing it internasally right into your system. And so you, do you really want to be looking for the best deal out there? Because if there's a big or too good of a deal, that should be a really big red flag. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, the thing with peptides is they are what I would call a blind item. Used to say that about diamonds, right? Diamonds are a blind item. It's sparkly and shiny, and you think it's a really great thing, and you take it to a real jeweler, and it turns out, oh, you have a piece of glass, or you've got a dirty whatever, right? Exactly. And, and in that case, you've lost a bunch of money. No, you know, it is what it is. When it comes to things that you're, as Karen says, you're introducing to your body, you don't know... You can't know what's in that vial, right? You don't know if what's in the vial is what you were told is in the vial. You don't know if there's as much of what you were told in the vial as you were told, as you bought. You don't know if there might be impurities in there. Um, There's a laundry list of it. Maybe, you know, when it comes to synthesizing peptides, they have to be, they have to be, they have to go through a number of processes. They need to be rinsed. And if they're not properly rinsed and um, cleaned, let's say, um, purified, let's say, at the end, uh, in a final step before they're lyophilized, um, there could be residual solvents in there, which are really not that good for you. So, you know, for those of us, for people who have taken that leap, when it's already a leap, right? Buying mm-hmm. peptides from research labs is already a leap. Um, mm-hmm. It's a really important to do your due diligence and or to work with someone who's done their due diligence so that you can be confident 
that what you're using is indeed what it said what you think it is and then it's going to act in such a way and in the unlikely event that something didn't didn't work for you that there's someone to go back to and say hey you know i had it it has happened at times even with the big labs but the thing difference with the big labs is they've kept of like um for every batch that they produce they withhold vials of product that are properly labeled they're cryogenically like they're frozen and should there ever be a problem they can go into their freezer they can pull out those mm. samples and they can retest them to see if indeed something went you know by some fluke because they test everything before they put it out there so at the end of the day as karen says shooting for the bottom is a bad idea um, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to buy the most expensive thing, but if it's not us who've done the work, then find yourself someone who's done the work and who can vouch for whoever you're doing business with. But as Karen said, like, you know, new peptide vendors are popping up like mushrooms. Like it's, it's out of control. Like you've got, you know, the occasional consumer coming forward with something in your group. In my Facebook group, it's like a crazy whack-a-mole game, right? Because mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. literally, like some of these new labs, they infiltrate the group with their friends and you're trying to basically, you know, and every once in a while, one of them might slip up and you identify them and you can pull them out. But it's, it's, it's a, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've heard some negative stuff from people that did buy from places they weren't sure if it oh, was yeah. a, a so, quality product yeah, and it wasn't one, good. One story I'll tell is, um, a friend of mine who I kind of had partnered with originally to for the Facebook group that I now run, um, he had called me up when he'd sent me a text and said, hey, Nat, I found BPC-157, 10 bucks a vial, 10 milligrams per vial on, I think it was on Alibaba or something. And I was, and this was at the very beginning, like we were just barely babies in, in this space. And so the two of us ordered like a whole whack of it. And so I'm sitting there looking at this stuff and I'm kind of thinking, hmm, gee, I don't know. I wonder, I'm not sure. He, on the other hand, much more reckless person than me, much younger. <laughs> and he just went ahead, reconstituted a vial and used it and within, I'm going to say inside of 10 minutes, he was covered in welts. Ooh. Covered. This oh, is, that's and, scary. Right? And so people are like, well, what's the big deal? Like, it's only a tiny little bit, and I'm putting it in the subcutaneous fat. Like, what could possibly go wrong? A ton. These are really powerful signaling molecules, guys. And so whatever was in that vial, it could have been that it was BPC-157, but maybe it brought some friends that were not so friendly. Mm -hmm. And so he mm -hmm. had a massive histamine response. Needless to say, every vial went into the garbage and neither one of us has ever gone down that road again. Right. Right. Yeah. Lesson and learned. Mm -hmm. We now run two big communities. We, you know, we work with, a, I don't necessarily work one-on-one -on -one as much with people anymore, but I'm, pr we're pretty clear with people that, you know, you, you just got to be smart. And it doesn't yeah. matter. And I'm not saying that anything from China is no good. I'm not because, you know, some of the vendors we use are sort. There are some really good labs in China, but there's mm -hmm. also lots of fly by nights and mm -hmm. you somebody's got to be in control. Somebody's got to be mm -hmm. really being, paying attention to make sure that what you're what you've got is what you think you've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. OK, Danny. Oh, we, you, you probably have more than anybody here <laughs> because you, your primary niche is blood sugar. And so what we see from, you know, fellow nutritionists and health coaches, and there's just, it's the market is so saturated, social media market is so saturated with information about blood sugar and nutrition. And, and you get some a very angry people, number one, and I think only that you I have to talk about, about I, I was going to say, about, That's yeah, only, I was going to say only time I get it. And I know that there are people out there who are plant-based who are kind, but those are not the people who come to my page. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I remember you just being like, that was like your number one thing that you said that night, which was oat milk. 
and oats in general. Like that one, I know I have stirred the pot on my own Instagram with that, where people get really, really angry if you dare say anything negative about oats. <laughs> yeah. A very emotional topic, apparently. Yeah, whoever did the marketing for oats in general, like, please come see me. I you did a seller yeah. job, but I think so. I Heart mean, health. Yeah, I, I just first want to say that blood sugar is completely bio individual, and there are going to be people out there who are metabolically healthy, and they have a great diversity of gut bacteria, and they digest really well, and oats fit, and they work, and they're fine, and it's great. But 93% of the population, at least here in the U.S., are metabolically unhealthy. And oats break down to sugar because they are full of starch, which are just long chains of glucose molecules. And then when we have oat milk, the sugar that is in oat milk, anytime we are processing a food, so turning oats into oat milk or even oats, like old-fashioned oats, into like the quickly more absorbable ones like the instant oats that I used to eat with dinosaur egg oatmeal back in the 90s. That was my favorite breakfast. But anyway, so um, when we're processing a food, we make it easier to absorb. And that means it's going to hit the bloodstream much faster, which is going to give us a much higher and bigger spike. And it's just more of an assault on the body. The body, when it as when it comes to anything, but also blood sugar doesn't like huge changes very quickly. And so with oat milk, the sugar in oat milk is actually two glucose molecules binded together called maltose. So traditional table sugar is called sucrose and that's one glucose and one fructose. So it's the, when we put on a continuous glucose monitor, we're measuring glucose. We're not measuring fructose. So we don't even see that the fructose has to go to the liver for processing, but it won't raise our blood sugar as much, just table sugar. With oat and oats and oat milk, it's that maltose and it's really gonna give you a big spike. It's in liquid form. There's nothing slowing down the absorption. And then a lot of these oat milks, they're not organic and not gluten-free. So if they're not organic, they will have been sprayed with glyphosate. You can guarantee it. So yeah. you're getting glyphosate, and a lot of the oat milks, especially if you're getting it at a coffee shop, they use these barista blends, barista blends, however you say that word, and they're loaded with vegetable oils, which they're then heating to froth up. So you are oxidizing vegetable oils, which should not be heated. These polyunsaturated fats are so easily damaged, turned into free radicals. And so those are the reasons why I don't like oat milk. It's an assault on your blood sugar. It could be very inflammatory, loaded with pesticides. And so people are like, what if I make my own? It's like, well, it's still the blood sugar component is going to apply. And so if you are someone who's very active, very metabolically healthy, perhaps this can fit in your diet, but that is not the vast majority, the very vast majority of people listening to this. So, I have good. a question. Sure. I have a question about oats. What yeah. about steel cut oats? Everyone asks that. It's, I know I mean, they do, because, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Because it's, it yeah. is like the original, and it's much higher fiber, which is why it takes so much longer to cook. I mean, personally, mm -hmm. I get heartburn from oats, so I can't. Like, I, I used to get heartburn. Down. From, yeah. from stuff with gluten. Like I could look at a bagel and just ooh, get heartburn. It's funny that oh, from that grains, I know <laughs> from from grains, I've, I've been gluten free for like 12 years. So it doesn't even phase me yeah. at this point. But um, yeah, so steel cut oats, I mean, it's there's more fiber. And so I think when it comes to things with blood sugar, we have to ask, is this the right food? Is this the right amount for my body? And is it the right timing? So mm -hmm. these are things that we need to, we need to know ourselves very well. Continuous glucose monitors really come into play here. But of course we could be having a giant insulin spike in the background that's completely invisible. And so we might look, it might look like our blood sugar is fine. So first off, are you metabolically healthy? Like, do you fall into this like percent of people where you can tolerate carbohydrates. So if you're fasting insulin, if you get it checked and if it's like above five, I would say that oats are not going to be a good food for you right now. And mm -hmm. we want to get you to a place where you can tolerate some of these things. You know, oats are yeah. a traditional food for some, some cultures, especially if they're like soaked or something like that, where we get some of these anti-nutrients out, if they're organic, gluten-free, things like this. So they're not the devil, but they're also for the average person, they're still, even the steel cut oats is a giant bowl of starch, 
with extra fiber. So it is slower. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, it might be a good source of carbs after a strong, after like a hard workout. So this is where the timing piece comes in. So sometimes we can, we can tolerate carbohydrates a lot better after we deplete our muscles of this stored sugar called glycogen. So Nat, you said you had a really hard workout today and your blood sugar is going a little low. So it maybe oats would have been a good choice there, right? Organic Mm gluten-free. Steel cut, maybe, maybe, but if I'm with sitting at, yeah, with, and, and of <laughs> course we want to, thank you. It's like, we really want to make sure we're getting a lot of protein. Um, I don't really like to add too much fat when there's a lot of carbs because mm-hmm. then we do get the insulin spike and now it's storing everything. So higher in protein, lower in fat, and then we have the carbs. So we want to alternate those energy sources. But if you're like most people, most North Americans sitting at a desk, stewing at emails, your stress load is high, you're not really moving, you're indoors, your bright blue light is on you, this is a big thing, that your blood sugar and insulin response, when there's bright light on you, like these LED lights or artificial lights, it will be higher. So these are the people who you're not using all that fuel you're putting in. So that's where the quantity comes in. Maybe I can do a tiny little quarter of a cup and that's that will be what works for me but um Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah well and I think you bring up a good point on the portion sizes and that's always been the big issue is very often we don't pay attention to portion size Mm -hmm. um and very often the portion size we may be having is not what's recommended on the box Mm -hmm. right I think when it comes to steel cut oats a portion might be a quarter cup that may Mm -hmm. You know, it'll expand when you cook it, Mm -hmm. but it's still only a quarter cup. Whereas I know like my husband, you give him a quarter cup of oats and he'll laugh you out of the room. He's like, what's this? What is this? A pinch of breadcrumbs? You know, it's like nothing. One spoon. One spoon. I don't know. Like, I mean, and I, you know, so we, I just make sure I have the right food in the house for him so that we don't have to have that conversation. (laughs) But, but portion, but portions is a big deal. It's like kombucha. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, which is a right. great drink. It's a fermented drink. It's got lots of great, but one brand to the next. And I mean, this is Danny's territory. A hundred percent is going to be some brands are super high in sugar. Otherwise aren't, but always, if you read the bottle and, and for some reason, I don't know why kombucha always comes in these, almost always comes in these giant bottles and the appropriate dose or portion is very rarely that whole bottle all at once. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could say like, oh, it's not like an all or nothing with something like kombucha, but if you find a low sugar brand that yeah. doesn't have extra grape juice added, like GTs, which is a very popular brand here in the US, and then you have like a small amount to get some probiotics, then that could be great. Then these things can fit. So when it comes to whole foods, I don't want to demonize whole foods, but mm-hmm. the quantity really matters. So Uh, just a quick snippet of my own personal story is that I was eating paleo. I was having all whole foods. I was having all real foods, but I was severely insulin resistant with hypoglycemia because I was overdoing the quantity of carbohydrates and insulin resistance is a state of carbohydrate intolerance. So we want to improve the body's ability to tolerate those and not be, you know, not have to be super, super low carb forever. Yeah. Yeah. So I do really Karen, like oats, just so everybody knows. No, but you know what? Like Danny, said, I never eat them because they make me feel sick. But oh, it's like a treat. It's like dessert, yeah. yeah, with some heavy cream and like, oh my god, and some raisins. Oh, oh my, it's it is literally Have dessert with to me. Sugar, why don't you? <laughs> exactly, it's dessert. I look at it as dessert, and I I maybe eat it once every couple of years, if that. And That's like, funny. I can't remember the last time I had it, but. I do think it's delicious. Well, now that you're doing glycogen depleting workouts, maybe you can have it more often. You never know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks to the Carol bike. That's right. Little, little shameless plug. All three I love of us my have Carol a Carol bike. bike. The one I'm thing obsessed. we've all resisted doing is getting on the same, um, on the same leaderboard. And I think it's because all three of us are so competitive. We're afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid that, oh my God, this is going to, this is going to make sure like, then I really have to do it, but I'm already committed. Like I'm already doing it. I do it because it's, so for those that don't know what a Carol bike is, it's similar to a Peloton, I'm guessing. No, it's It's different. different. Oh, it's not. Oh, okay. Completely different. It's an AI. Okay. You you can do a Peloton workout on a Carol bike, but you can't do a Carol workout on a Peloton because the big difference is that Carol 
uses AI to adjust the resistance of the bike against you based on your output. So that oh. workout that is crushing you right now, it'll never change. The workout will change, is what I mean, but it'll never get easier because the bike mm. will continue to adapt. As you adapt, it'll adapt. So you will get okay. stronger as a result, but it never gets easier, which is kind of, it's like a Sisyphean kind of workout, yeah. as all workouts should be, right? Because yes. as soon as your workout becomes easy, it becomes essentially useless to you. Yeah, and you're yeah, not getting the where, adaptation from exactly. it. Exactly, so, so that's yeah. where Carol really blows the competition out of the water in that, you know, and that, and you, the fact that you can do it in five or 10 minutes and get your workout out of the day. And as Carol says, big tick. Big tick. Now yes. you can go to the gym because you want to, not, not because, you, because have you have to. to. Oh my gosh, that's, Nat, that's so funny. So you're listening to the tiger track. So a quick Carol story. I get when chased I first... by tigers every day. <laughs> yeah, so when I, so when I got this bike, it was like you do this this specific workout for Carol and it's two sprints of 20 seconds. That is it. You're doing 40 seconds of work, hardest workout I've ever done. So I looked at all the music choices and it was like pop, rock, disco, tiger. I was like, what kind of music is tiger? Let's pick tiger. So you pick tiger and it's this nice British woman narrating like, just walk and pay attention to your breath. A Neanderthal only walked or ran for his life. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's foreshadowing. And then they're like, because you never know, it could be lurking around these corners. And then all of a sudden, the, this like monkeys start shouting and there's music and drums. And they, they she like narrates that a tiger is chasing you. And so, so my friend- And everything goes bright red on your screen and it's like, go! And you're like, oh my God! <laughs> And so my friend, um, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Tiger King back when COVID first started, but yes. it was a Carol bike and I'm getting chased by a tiger. My friend started calling me Carol Baskin every time I used the bike. <laughs> So anyway, that's my story. <laughs> Anyways, we're, we're hopefully going to have a leaderboard where everybody around the world that's got a Carol bike can join our leaderboard yes. and compete with us on our Carol bikes. Carol bike um, says you only have to do, I think it is three or three times a week or four three times a week, three, three, three times, times a week, week for five minutes. Yeah. yeah. And, that's I mean, it. Do, and that'll I, improve your health. Yeah. I, I'm old school. I go with 10 minutes and then I do a fat burn on the weekends, but, um, but you can do longer workouts. Anyway, we, we, yeah. gonna, we yeah, were, yeah. this wasn't meant to be an ad for Carol, we, for we're Carol. Just all, but the point being that that type of workout, that 20 minute all out sprint, a 20 second all out sprint twice depletes what Danny was talking about earlier, the glycogen in your largest muscle groups, which is your quads. And the benefit of that is it basically makes your muscles hungry to refeed. And so if you were it's gonna like sponges, have, you squeeze yeah, them so out. Were, yeah, so if you were gonna have carbs, sometime after that workout would be a really good time because now you're, you're refilling those muscles, you're re repleting your glycogen stores, and you're less likely to have the negative impact of the glucose. Yeah, and glucose. you probably won't even get a, a glucose spike at all if you have something right after that workout or a glycogen depleting workout. It doesn't have to be on the Carol bike, but yeah, it, it, because there's a lot of glucose that just goes into the muscles that doesn't even need insulin. And so when you're working out, it's such a, it's such a hack to be able to tolerate more carbohydrates. And I love that the Carol bike also improves uh, mitochondrial uh, genesis. So you're making new mitochondria, which is awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've That's been it. talking about, we've talked about peptides, we've talked about blood sugar. So Karen, let's talk about hormones. Let's talk about yes. lady hormones because you just, I mean, so exciting guys. You heard it here. Well, probably not first by the time you're listening to this podcast, but if you haven't been paying attention, Karen just came out with her brand, her own line of hormones, which is super exciting um, to her and to us, to all of us really. But but Karen, talk, maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, women's hormones around menopause and how maybe they play into insulin sensitivity or lack thereof, and even, um, you know, muscle building, fat loss, like all the things, mm -hmm. right? because yeah. we know that those I think hormones are massively coming into play here. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. shouldn't women not take hormones, though, because they cause cancer, though? So maybe I should start. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, where I'll start is the misinformation around the hormone 
the hormones and hormone replacement therapy and the blood sugar piece. And so there's kind of two different stances on this where you're going to get a lot of functional medicine practitioners uh, or hormone coaches, um, nutritionists that are going to say, you know, as you start to go through perimenopause and into menopause, you have to be doing everything from, you know, fasting all the time. You've got to prioritize your protein. You've got to be exercising like crazy. You've got to be, you know, building muscle. All good things. Like as I'm not dissing those things. Failing. Yes. Yeah, as your adrenals are like, yeah, we have to understand that as we get into perimenopause and menopause, our cortisol levels in our adrenal system gets very sensitive. And so we can get very dysregulated. I have probably done a thousand different cortisol circadian rhythm tests to see where someone's cortisol levels are throughout the day. And I will tell you right now, I like, I would say 80 to 85%, if not more, have dysregulated cortisol levels. So that means either too high, so they're up here with their cortisol, which is horrible for your blood sugar, or they're super low and they're in that burnout phase of adrenal insufficiency. So neither neither are good. They can really mimic each other as well for symptoms. So, you know, as we're coming into this time in our life, which is usually late 30s, early 40s, where we start to lose hormonal function or ovarian function and then our hormones start to drop, we're being told like, you've got to do all of these things before you take hormones. And, you know, that's that can work for some people and it can help with the transition from perimenopause to menopause, right? We obviously want to have those pieces as foundational, but I see a large group of women who are feeling so horrible because of their loss of hormones. Some women are more sensitive to it than others that might be in that adrenal insufficiency or they've got their thyroid starting to drop. That's a very, very common thing to happen. You could have no thyroid problems your entire life and then you hit perimenopause and your thyroid can start to go down. Mm -hmm. um, this is because they all interplay together. We need progesterone to help with the production of thyroid and thyroid helps with the production of progesterone. And so we have this you know, beautiful back and forth that starts to happen. We start to become inflamed as we lose estrogen. So all of these things start to happen and, and you become insulin resistant with the loss of the hormones. And so telling somebody that let's say has some hypothyroidism going on. They don't even, it hasn't even been diagnosed yet because usually it isn't. So they're feeling low. And if you've ever experienced low thyroid symptoms, it's terrible. When mine crashed, I couldn't get off my couch. Mm -hmm. I was severely depressed. I wasn't sleeping. I was fat. I had gained like 10 pounds in a month. I mean, I, if someone had said to me, like, before you take thyroid hormones, you get out there and you start exercising first. I had a total intolerance to exercise. I couldn't. I hated it. The thought of actually going out there and like putting on, getting a sweat on, well, uh, there was no way. Oh, like who wants to exercise and who wants to eat well when you're depressed and you're lying on the couch and you have no energy? Nobody. And, and if it, even if it's not that bad, let's say you've got adrenal insufficiency and you're burnt out, to tell that person, like, just get off your ass and go exercise, that's not fair. Your body's, when you're in that state, you're really craving sugar because your body's really needing that energy source. And so a lot of the time it has to be flipped around. And I, and I really hope to see that more practitioners start to get on board with this. Um, where we want to, for some people, not everybody, but for some people, the hormone replacement therapy actually has to come first. Mm -hmm. And even though we want to have all of those things in place, and it'd be great to have them in place because your body's going to take the hormones on a lot better when you're having good nutrition and you're exercising and being able to circulate the hormones and having good, back, good bacteria to process the hormones. That is great, but for some people, they need that boost. They need that little bit of thyroid hormone. They need that little bit of progesterone so that they're not so anxiety ridden. They can actually start to sleep again. And then therefore they're going to have more energy to go out and work out and, and find it easier to eat well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes these things have to come first. And I get really frustrated where, 
you'll hear these functional practitioners saying to somebody that's got outward like hypothyroid labs and they're saying we're just going to try and fix your adrenals first and and then it's like two years later their thyroid markers haven't moved and they're still trying to get them to work on and it's like actually why don't we give them some thyroid hormone so they have a little bit of energy thyroid actually helps cortisol to come up if they if they're in adrenal insufficiency and then they can start repairing the system and then they can get to the root cause of the hypothyroidism and then slowly wean off the medication if that's what they choose to do so it's just that you know we we shouldn't be so like you know, don't do hormones for as long as possible. That's not the right attitude to have. And also, as we start to go through this, our 40s, one of the biggest symptoms that, of course, we hear about is weight gain. Mm -hmm. And if we could actually get in before you completely lose ovarian function with these hormones, you're actually going to have a much better, smoother ride into menopause. Perimenopause can be over 10 years. So a lot of doctors are like holding, withholding estrogen from women. This is like 90% of practitioners too. They're saying, you can't, don't take estrogen. It's going to give you breast cancer. We won't give it to you unless you absolutely have to have it. Like your vagina is closing down and you're hot flashing all day and you're falling apart. Okay, well now we'll maybe give you some estrogen as long as you don't have a cycle anymore. And that is really, really the wrong way to think about it. And you're, that woman is going to be at a complete disservice. Like it's, it's, you're, it's terrible, terrible, terrible because that could have, she could be th that hot mess for 10 years and nobody's giving her estrogen, which her body's needing because she's that still has somewhat of a period. So estrogen to Danny's point, it. We know now, like the, there's research that has come out. There was a great paper done just last year doing a reanalysis of the WHI study that actually shows that women that were on estrogen only actually had a decrease in developing breast cancer by 24%. And so it can actually help to prevent breast cancer. Now, if you have a history of breast cancer, it's an estrogen, if it, and it was estrogen positive, no, you don't want to take estrogen, obviously. But what the research is showing is that actually estrogen can be breast protective, as can progesterone be breast protective. And estrogen is a hormone that we have an abundance of our entire fertile lives. And then suddenly it becomes this dangerous, dangerous hormone that's going to kill all of us women and give us all breast cancer if we, you know, take this in menopause which is absolutely terrible to say to a woman because estrogen is our most important hormone. It's what preserves our brain. It helps with our heart function, helps with insulin sensitivity. I mean, the list, osteoporosis, Bones. the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the list is just, it's so far reaching. We've got, they say something like 800 different functions that depend somewhat on estrogen. And so to tell somebody that's had this hormone their entire life that are we blocking estrogen in all of our young women because it's going to give them breast cancer? No, we actually see the highest cases of breast cancer in menopausal women when they lose their estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's my rant on that. I, I get that. very, very <laughs> passionate about it. <laughs> I feel like this is not a perfect analogy, but it's almost like the way you're describing how doctors are sort of like withholding and practitioners are like not giving the hormones first. It almost feels like if someone sprains their ankle and they don't get crutches because that's not working on the root cause. It's like, well, it helps, you know, it helps you be able to do what you need to do, you know? And so I think like it's a silly analogy, but that's sort of what was coming to my mind. No, it's good. Yeah. I, I yeah. actually interviewed someone recently who talked about it as, you know, she used the word replenishment instead of replacement. And mm. what's nice about that word is that it allows, um, it allow, it opens the conversation about bringing hormones in before you've lost them completely, mm. right? Before the ovaries have completely thrown in the towel and handed the baton to the adrenals who've been trying to run the race as it is, and now they're being handed another 
you know, another They're like a single mom <laughs> who and now just like, got... Wait, what? <laughs> you want me to make estrogen now? And it's like, I, I've been, I, I can barely keep up with cortisol and, you know, which is part of the, what drags down the thyroid because the adrenals are like, look, I can't keep up. You need to slow down, dude, because I just, mm -hmm. I can't keep up anymore. But... But she, the what, and it leaves that conversation open to say to a woman, you know, your your hormones are shifting through perimenopause, and so even if you still have a cycle, let's see. And the pro, and it, this is an art. And I think I wonder if one of the reasons why more physicians don't do this is because it's more complicated. You really, like, it's mm -hmm. not like there's a steady decline. It's not that you know no. from one month to the next what's going to happen. It really becomes a fine art of titrating different things at different times to help women through this time and maybe try, and, and I think you talked about this, just smooth the ride, right? So you're not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up here and then getting dropped and then up and then dropped again. So it's, exactly. you know, it's coming at it maybe with a bit more compassion mm -hmm. and, and, and empathy. And, and that's where, I mean, I just think that's where the, we want to look for physicians and practitioners who are going to have that compassion and empathy and say, okay, you know, we're in this together. Let's see if we can figure it out. What can we do to help you? And I think the, the first sign to run for the hills and find a new doc is someone that looks at you and goes, sorry about your luck. You're going through perimenopause. Buckle up. It's going to be a rough ride. See ya. <laughs> See you in 10 years. Yeah. You know, <laughs> then they'll and, give you and, hormones. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, sadly, I think, what are your thoughts on, um, I'm curious, Karen, what are your thoughts on pellets? Because I personally, they give me hives. I, I, and not literally, but I just feel that it's a three-month commitment. <laughs> and so if you don't get it right, you're a little bit stuck with something that may not be working for you. And there seems to be like mm -hmm. these pellet, um, uh, practices I don't know like these yeah it's a franchise yeah so it's it's like mm -hmm. it's like this biotech it's the big one like mm -hmm. is it that like do they take a weekend course and then hand out pellet like yep yep seriously I yep was, I was yeah like, and then <laughs> I was no joking. yeah it's it's a course um and then they I actually just did a podcast with uh, my nurse practitioner who works for me and she works in a pellet clinic they do pellets they do everything but she's she's got a really good attitude about it but she said you know basically they're they're typing in somebody's weight age uh you know levels and then it spits out a number and it says give this person this many pallets and this many milligrams whatever here you go so then they're injected into your butt and once they're in there they cannot get them out you are with them for three months some people love it they're like oh my god i've never I've felt so that. great in my entire life like this is amazing number one because it gives you a really big hit in the when you first have them in um don't believe it when they say oh it's just a slow release over three months that's not true we've done labs on people with with pellets for, in month one month two month three and you see a big whammo in that first month and so a lot of the time women specifically they get a steroid high and they'll come back and be like, wow, like, is this what a man feels like? Like, no wonder they have less emotional problems and stuff that women do because you literally are having a steroid high. It gives you energy. You want to have sex all the time. You can put muscle on. You're just like, go get them. And then they crash. I had somebody in my group yesterday actually say, I, I did the pellets. And she said, I felt better than I ever have for a month and a half. And then I completely crashed. And she mm -hmm. said... I have felt now horrible and I have to wait for the next insertion. She's like, I can't afford $400 every month and a half for these pellets. And so she's like, what are my options? Like, I want to feel that good. And I said, well, you might be feeling a little bit too good. I said, had you continue down that road, you could actually start to develop masculine symptoms because that's actually a sign that it's too high. And it, yes, it feels good. It's like a drug. And it's like, whoo, what? That's like, you know, that's a lot because your testosterone levels, you know, as a woman, high end is 50. These women are coming around with like f levels of 400 from the pellets. Oh, I've seen it. Are they losing hair and time getting facial hair? And time Yes. I just had a woman who sent in a question for a Q&A on my podcast and she said I was on pellets, felt amazing, but I started, my clitoris has, has 
grown and it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And she's like, is this ever going to go down? And I was like, there's, there's actually some do, some don't. Same with the cracking. I've had clients that have had their voice start cracking. And if you catch it early enough and you catch the clitoral enlargement early enough and you stop the therapy, then it has a very high chance of going back to normal. But this woman had continued doing pellets and then she went to injectables. So her levels have not, she hasn't taken a break from it. So it hasn't gone down. So I was like, you may want to take a break to have that come down or you're going to, you know, it could keep going. You could get a clitinus. Like that's just, that's a fact. And it happens. I've had women say it's uncomfortable to walk because their clitoris has expanded so much. Yeah. So not, yeah, we want to be very careful. So pellets. Well, that's new information and a new word for the day. Clitinus. (laughs) Clitinus. Clitinus. We don't want to grow a clitinus. We don't want to grow a beard, right? Um, Keep the hair on your head, off your chin. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So that's the thing is there's two pathways we can push our testosterone down, the 5-alpha reductase pathway or the 5-beta. 5-alpha means that you are going to be pushing your testosterone down into what's called dihydrotestosterone. When you do a Dutch test, they actually give you a little fan dial and it'll tell you, are you pushing down the beta preference or are you pushing down the 5-alpha preference? Personally, I do. I I push down 5-alpha. I also have a genetic SNP or missing the genetic SNP. I can't remember how that works, but where I don't metabolize my testosterone very well. So it builds up in my system. So I took an injectable testosterone at at a dose that was right for my levels. But in two weeks, I looked like a a 13-year-old teenage girl with acne all over my face. My face was super greasy. And then eventually it was, you know, you started to lose the hair a little bit. Um, I had a couple of black whiskers come out. I did stop it right away. And I went and then I, I just said, I'm just going to go off of it for, for a little while and then go back at a half the dose, which is where I'm happy. I don't get any of the side effects. But imagine had I put in the pellets. They would have given me this whammo dose. I would have had to go three months. It also makes me carry a lot of water. So I start to get fat. So I would have been puffy, water retentive, with a pizza face, no head on the hair on my, no hair on my head, and a beard, and maybe a clitinus. So we, that, well, that's why I don't do pellets. Like I, that's not my first choice. You always, if you want, if that's something that appeals to you, please just go do injectables or cream for your first three months. Get the dosage right. See how your body responds because we're all individual. And, and then if you still at that point think oh, I want to try pellets, great, go for it. But you got to be very, very careful. Wow. That's super surprising. <laughs> Great information. Cause I hear about those pellets from a lot of my clients as well. Yeah. They're very popular. Yeah. Well, sh- I'm wondering if we should hit the, the weight loss peptides, Nat. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> let's do it. So the weight loss peptides have taken the world by storm. <laughs> and good storm, bad storm. It's a storm. It's, you know, It's a hot mess, actually. It's a hot mess. So, I mean, it is and it isn't, right? So the weight loss peptides, admittedly, are the first thing that's come out after all the pills and all the potions and all the drugs and all the things that actually works. It actually, they actually help people to release weight um, that they've been stuck with for a really long time, effectively. And Mm -hmm. the beauty of them is that as opposed to so many drugs that have a lot of negative side effects, they actually have positive side effects. There's positive side effects for the brain. There's positive side effects for the heart, for the kidneys. Um, there's positive side of, there's They're being studied for alt, in Alzheimer's because they help improve insulin sensitivity. And we know that in some cases, Alzheimer's is insulin resistance in the brain. So if we can make those neurons more receptive to absorbing glucose for energy, they might not die as much. They get better energy. But anyway, so there's studies around that. Um, so there, you could almost call them peptides with benefits. And they do effectively help the body to release weight. So the first one that came out was called semaglutide, which came out as ozempic. Then the next red carpet that got rolled out was terzepatide, which is munjaro. And there's a third one coming down called um, ritatrutide, which I don't know what the brand name, there is a brand name, I forget what it's called, 
regardless, semaglutide is a GLP-1 agonist. Terzepatide, which is a single incretin. Terzepatide is a dual incretin, so it's going at it from two different pathways, both the GIP and the GLP-1. And then ritotrutide is a triple incretin because it's going at it through a third pathway. Great. All good, right? So if you've been watching the media lately, you've heard about ozempic face. You probably are now familiar with a term that is gastroparesis. You're probably now heard about pancreatitis. You've heard that people, I mean, it sounds like people are running around. Muscle nauseous, loss. Nauseous, throwing up, melting muscle. Um, what else? I, I, fatigue, the whole nine yards. So can those things happen? Yes, but, oh, and thyroid cancer. Let's not forget about that. So can, so the two black box warnings on both, and I, we don't know as, I don't know as much about ritotrutide because it's not through its final clinical trials yet. There no, are people yeah. who've gotten their hands on it and have jumped the gun. I don't think it's super smart personally. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. It's scary effective to the point where one dose in the clinical trials was shown to people dropped, I think it was, was it eight or 10 pounds in a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. To and give it's it, super it's really, fast. And if you understand how fat loss works in the body, my feeling is that that is too fast. It's too fast mm -hmm. for the brain and the body to adapt to that change in adiposity. Now, if you have someone who's morbidly obese, that is where probably there's an application because that person needs movement and they need it fast. Mm -hmm. Anyway, staying away from those, going back to the first two, um, what I've seen, the, the thyroid cancer thing right now is not playing out in real life. It happened in rats in um, clinical trials. And the reason a lot of people believe that it does occur in rats and maybe not in humans is because rats thyroid glands are very, very rich in GLP-1 receptors, and we don't have that as humans. So out of an abundance of caution, if somebody has a history of thyroid cancer and maybe even a family history, you probably would stay away from these things. The pancreatitis, I have seen it happen a couple of times in my communities, and so it, it, it bears caution. If you have a history of pancreas issues, it might not be the right thing for you, um, there are a lot of physicians that will sometimes administer, they'll do things to support the pancreas while they're using the GLP-1 agonist. For me, I will sometimes recommend that people do a couple of runs of the pancreatic bioregulator. There are physicians that, or sometimes people will take oral BPC-157 because BPC-157 is very protective to the pancreas, so it might help things along. Mm. Obviously, we are recommending that people maybe avoid alcohol and don't eat a whole lot of like super high fat and super high sugar things, right? So we don't mm -hmm. want to overstress the organ. Um, on the gastroparesis, which is like a paralysis of the, the GI, like of the stomach and, the, and, and that whole lower GI tract, what, the, what those GLP-1 agonists do is they do slow gastric emptying. And so one of the things which means food sits in your stomach longer. And especially with semaglutide, we, see, we do see a much higher incidence of constipation. If that's an issue, and if that's an issue already pre-existing for you, then your practitioner slash doctor, whoever's coaching you through this, should be working with you to make sure that you're keeping things moving. And whether that's with uh, supplements or probiotics, or and it's gonna be different for every person. There's gonna be a different mm -hmm. solution for every person. But definitely, it's something to watch out for, right? Terzepatide is not as bad. When it comes to nausea, much worse with semaglutide than with terzepatide, and can yeah. get mitigated for 90% of the population in both instances as long as people start low and increase very gradually. Mm -hmm. um, finally, on the muscle loss, and this is where everybody kind of loses their marbles a little bit, you will not lose your muscle if you... Eat protein, like as our good friend Amy Horneman says, like it's your job, and if you exercise. So here's one of the other things that these compounds do. They improve insulin sensitivity, particularly at skeletal muscle. What does that mean? That means my muscles become hungrier for fuel, 
Which means, if we think about it, and we don't need to be a scientist to figure this one out, it means it should make it easier for us to exercise. So the, 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 the recipe for success is that we use these compounds at the lowest dose possible just so that we start to see the needle move. I've had people complain to me, well, I'm only losing a pound a week. I know, same. I'm like, I'm what? We're like, you don't want to lose faster than that. <laughs> no, you do not. You want to give, because we do see over time in, in many people a reset of, you can see a reset in the hypothalamus of your set weight. This means that this can be a long-term change that becomes easier to hang on to. So what we want is people to eat protein. Now, here's the problem. You're not going to be that hungry, guys right? So it is really hard as it is 90% of us go into this not eating enough protein to begin with. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to make sure that you're hitting your protein goals. If you can't do it with food, then use essential amino acids, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number two, nutrient density is very important because you're not, again, you're not eating enough food. So one of the things that I do is I recommend people use a good greens powder, a good reds powder, because you can at least drink those micronutrients without, um, without having to have a lot of food with it because you're not that hungry. So eating a very high quality nutrient dense diet is really important. And as Karen said earlier with the hormones, you know, when somebody's carrying a lot of weight, they're tired, they're inflamed, they're sore. So we don't expect everybody to go running to the gym the minute they start these things. But as soon as you start to feel yourself feeling a little bit better, start going out for a walk because exercise to your body is whatever is more than you were doing before. I can oh, walk, that's great. Right? So if I've been working out really hard, going out for a walk, it's not going to cause that. It's not going to drive adaptation in my system. But if I've been suffering with being overweight and being inflamed and being exhausted for a really long time, and now all of a sudden I can go walking, this becomes, this is going to drive adaptation to my body. So be kind to yourself. But as soon as you start to get that energy back, now's the time to start moving. And... Mm -hmm. Right. And so and so there's different populations of people that are served by these. And there seems to be this thing going on in society. And we were talking about this before we started recording where people feel that people are cheating. Right. So mm -hmm. we've got obviously people who are obese. This is who these drugs are made for and type two diabetics. Everybody else who's got. 10, 20, well, probably 20, 30 pounds to lose or more. And in there, we find your clientele, Karen, and even yours, Danny, mm -hmm. in, right? Women who are postmenopausal, who've been working so hard, who've dialed in their diet, they're exercising, they're doing everything right, and the weight just won't come off. Like, it just won't. Mm -hmm. And so that mm -hmm. population of people is, like, it's so amazing for them if they do it right and yeah i i will say to my clients and i'm sure you do the same karen this is an opportunity for you to recalibrate your taste buds this is an opportunity now that the cravings have been quieted because it does affect the food reward center in your brain so now that those that food chatter is quieter and you don't have those same cravings now's the time for you to re-educate your taste buds reshape your diet so that you can eventually, hopefully, come off of these things and be able to maintain it because you will have evolved your diet, you will have evolved your lifestyle, you have, will have rebuilt lean muscle. Now you have the machine to burn fat and you'll be able to kind of go on your merry way. And we know those people, right? Mm -hmm. But it does take work and participation. So, you know... It, the, We're always going to get the people that... yeah are probably abusing these things like like every drug is abused out there and every peptide can be abused out there too and we're seeing you know we were talking about this earlier too is are we seeing any shaming going on anywhere else about using other peptides like people aren't like you know saying oh how dare you use bpc 157 to drop your inflammation and heal your gut you are you're taking the easy way out and shame on you like 
we don't see that anywhere. It's just when it comes to weight loss and there's just something that is so triggering for so many people around this. And they're like, well, it's going to cause you stomach paralysis. Look at the research. It's, we have over 10 years of research. It's, I, I've, I've read it was less than 1%, but it's also something that's very common in type 2 diabetics to get. So we don't know if it's the, the, the people that it did happen to, did they already have a susceptibility to that because they were type 2 diabetic? Um, the pancreatitis, I do believe, was less than 3%. And this has been on research on thousands and thousands of people has been around forever. We've had millions of people now doing it. So the, the safety profile is actually pretty damn good compared to what is the consequences of being having metabolic disease? Yeah, yeah that's what 100%. I was going to say. And that was what my argument was, is that there are way more people suffering from consequences of metabolic issues, obesity, diabetes, pre-diabetes, pre-pre-diabetes, which is not talked about enough, which is 43% mm -hmm. of the population who doesn't fall into the pre-diabetic or diabetic category yet. People like me, I didn't think that I had to care about my blood sugar because I was not diabetic, but there's a lot of people who do need to care about it. But this idea that people are, I mean, we are bankrupting the healthcare system on costs from complications of diabetes and people are getting sicker and sicker. And it's like, there's something to help. Just like you said, we're not shaming people for healing their knee with BPC-157. And there's so much shaming against people who are in bigger bodies, yet we're not, you're like, no, but you can't have the access to that tool. And it, <laughs> it's like our environment is set up for us to be gaining weight. There's blue lights yeah. and fake lights everywhere. I don't know about you guys in Canada, but they switched out the street lights here and all the lights in every single building. So there's no more incandescent bulbs. Mm -hmm. And the reason this matters is because these the lights that are being used are very, very high in blue frequencies of light. And blue light that we also get from the sun, but we also get it with red light and infrared and all these balanced tones, but it does raise cortisol during the day. That's why we do need to get light. That's why my window is cracked. But we're getting these, the, these blue lights in so much of, hello, our phones, like, and, and TVs and devices, we are just so influxed with this blue light all the time that is, is actually changing how we metabolize food. If there's studies that show that blue light on people, so they did three groups, blue light in the morning meal, blue light in the evening meal, and then dim light. So the dim light people had the best metabolic response to the meals. They had the lowest insulin. Wow. Both of the groups that had blue light shown on them had more insulin resistance, but blue light is more natural in the morning and mm -hmm. it's not natural at night. We evolved not to have any blue light at all at night. And so the, this group had higher insulin resistance and higher blood sugar responses to those meals. And so we're inundated with blue light. There's, there's EMFs everywhere, which are like putting us basically in a microwave all the time. Um, there's toxins everywhere and toxins get stored in our fat and all of the food is ultra processed. We talked about earlier, Nat, when you were saying like, why would you get the very cheapest peptide? It's something you're going to put in your body. That's going to impact your system same thing with food like why are we mm. looking for like the deepest sale and i understand that like i i'm speaking from a place of privilege and i fully see that um and it's it's terrible like you go to food pantries my friend uh michelle she was doing a lot of work called the protein project to try to get people in food pantries to have access to protein because their protein in there peanut butter that's like yeah. the protein that's not a complete protein it's a plant-based protein. It's loaded with fat and actually carbs. Like it's, so we're not getting like the, the dietary guidelines, like all these things are setting us up to be so overweight and have such a hard time losing it. It's super stressful mm -hmm. out there. Like literally everything I could think about of our modern society, all the stress sitting down all the time, like like just everything is causing us to hold on to weight. So we don't have an easy playing field. Diet and exercise doesn't work 
anymore. It just doesn't. Like it might have in the Thank 70s. You. It yeah. doesn't work anymore. And then we're losing our hormones. And like there's just so many complications. The food is ultra processed. Everything is high in sugar. And, and there's, I don't know. It's just crazy. So yeah. I'll come Well, back. I think the diet and exercise, it, it's not enough. It's not enough. It does yeah, work. Exactly. But it's not enough. Right. And it so has to be there. I think. Yeah, I think that the point about the these weight loss peptides it, to take away is that they're a really great tool and they do need to be applied properly. So from that, mm -hmm. and the last thing, you know, the, the Ozempic face discussion, that's actually, first of all, anybody who loses a lot of weight is going, it, and it's, I believe this is a genetic thing, whether you lose it in your face or you lose it in your butt or you lose it, like different people lose weight in different places at different rates. So it can be a thing, but for most, for many people, it's not. So, mm -hmm. you know, be mindful. I think we have to be mindful around these things. I think a lot of the shaming legitimately does happen more around the person who's trying to lose 20 pounds or 10 pounds, right? It's the, where people get really- Which isn't fair either. I no, had somebody say it to people, me the other day about that. Yeah, they were like, yeah. oh, you, are you still losing? They should put this on my Instagram. Are you still losing weight? Um, Cause that 10 pounds seems to be vanity pounds to me. That, that seems like vanity That's pounds a judgment. to me. Like, I'm what like, kind of judgment is that? Exactly. It's like, I, I'm sorry, but do you not want to look good? Like we all have our standards of where we want to look and how we want to look. I've, even, I've done a whole podcast about this before the peptides were even a thing um, in my world anyways, where I said like, who are you to judge if somebody comes to me and if they're like, my whole life I've been 110 pounds, that's where I'm comfortable. I'm five feet tall, I'm 110 pounds. And with menopause, I gained 15 pounds and I am not comfortable here. Mm -hmm. And they're doing everything they possibly can to get it off. And so if somebody like that chooses to do the peptides just to go back to her normal weight, who are we to judge that? That's not, that's her, yeah, for sure. We don't want to see people going anorexic and, and abusing these things. But like for me, I, I was okay with where I was, but I was 10 pounds over what I normally should be and what I was for my entire 40s. And then, you know, menopause or not my entire 40s, my entire 30s. Point being is I, I was okay with it and trying to wrap my, my head around it and accept my body and be like, okay, well, you know, I'm getting older. I got to get a little bit softer and that's cool. Like I accept my curves, but then these peptides came along and I was like, well, why not try? And so I did them and my, and only had to do them for a couple of months. I dropped the weight and some, which I'm not too skinny. I'm not for how to, I'm five, three, you know, and it's like, this is a normal weight. I'm not anorexic. I'm not starving myself. My hunger came back within a couple of months of doing them, which by the way, it does. People yeah. panic and think, oh, my hunger is coming back. I'm not going to lose weight. I'm like, actually, this is a good thing. Eat. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to eat my normal diet I and, and maintain my weight loss. And it's been great. And it's been now six months of this where I've I've gone back to complete normal calorie intake. So to give me that little boot, like, why is that not okay? But yet it's okay to go get fake breasts and it's okay to get a facelift and it's okay to starve yourself out on any other diet and try some wacky thing, you know, but it's not okay for that. It just, it just is mind blowing the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, again, like, I think you're, you're so right about that. And I do think that you know, we need to check the judgment at the door. I think we do need to be responsible. I think someone who has a history of eating disorders probably yeah, should not stay a good away fit. from these things. Um, if you're pregnant, trying to get pregnant, this is not the thing. If you're nursing a baby, not the thing. Your body will drop weight. And maybe down the road, if you still can't lose it, you can have a conversation with your provider about it. But you know, I think if we could all just dial down the judgment a little bit, get a little yeah. bit more educated and be, be smart, right? Like mm -hmm. think about, is what I'm doing good for me? Is it going to, is it going to lead me down the path? Is it going to give me the opportunity to, you know, you're working on your hormones, you're working on your diet, you're working on your lifestyle. As Danny said, the light is a big deal. Um, even, you know, your diet, your exercise, your, 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 all these lifestyle pieces, going to sleep at the right time, all of these all add up 
But this one is a switch we can flip that can really ch move the needle when people get stuck. And mm -hmm. we have to trust people to be smart enough to, to, you, to pull the right levers while they're doing this so that it's a positive and not a negative. And go mm -hmm. slow, because one of the things I have seen is people get really impatient. They keep upping the dose, upping the dose, upping yes. the dose. Yeah. And, and, and paradoxically, and I saw this happen to a guy not too long ago, his body slammed on the brakes and went, well, pff, no, we're not doing this anymore. And he was obese. Like, he had a lot of weight to lose. He was doing really well at a lower dose. And his doctor, for reasons I don't really know, I'm sure he had his reasons, every couple of weeks was doubling the dose. And all of a sudden, they hit a wall. Like, he hit a wall. Everything came to a screeching halt. His appetite came screaming back. And, you know, I was like, mm, you know, maybe you might want to have a conversation with your doctor and see if backing down on that dose somehow gets things moving again. And sure enough, they reduce the dose. And I get a message from him saying, okay, we're back. You know, like his body had reengaged. And maybe it was almost like a shock response where the body was like, uh-oh, we're going to die. Mm. Everybody stop. Mm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. shut down. We're dying. We're, we're going to die. Um, so you got to kind of be gentler, right? I mean, if you, I said this a little bit earlier, like you need to understand that adipose tissue is, it's metabolically active. It, when those fat cells shrink, it damages the extracellular matrix. Like they are anchored. Your fat cells aren't just floating. They're anchored with different types of collagen. So you want to be really gradual in shrinking those fat cells and allowing adaptation to happen at a reasonable pace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, they're not for everybody, but for people no. who choose that this is what they, are, they need or want to do, there's a good way to do it. Take your time and get good guidance because I, I think yeah. that that's the way to go. Yeah, I wanted to share mm -hmm. um, just a tip of something that I've been seeing a lot lately in my community that can help people who are feeling like they're doing all the things right and maybe like, okay, I don't know if I want to go to the the peptides yet. And because yep. I like the idea of exhausting a lot of options, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, and yep. sometimes that's not the case, but so this is where I see a lot of people who are like, I'm doing everything right. My blood sugar is still high and I'm still holding on to weight. Of course, the light environment thing that has to be looked at big time because it's a huge stimulus to our brain because it's dark inside of our skull. So we need that light coming in. It's the biggest signaler to our brain of what time it is, what hormones to release when. So this concept of timing, I see so many people skipping breakfast and mm -hmm. they, they're so proud of themselves. They're like, I don't even feel hungry until one. And I'm like... I'm proud of you for like, you know, working on that fasting muscle and doing what we thought in, you know, 2018 was like the most important thing for your health. But what I see is that that works for a lot of people initially, but over time I see people, we t already talked about how stressed out we all are, how many stressors are coming at us to go in it the entire morning when we are usually our most busy, when we need nutrients. And Karen, you talked about the cortisol dysregulation, where if we're fasting all morning or just having coffee, which is an extra boost to the fast, if we're waking up and just the first thing we see is this bright blue light from our, from our phones, or we're flipping on the lights before sunrise because we live in Canada and it's still dark out, that is giving us this burst of cortisol, which is way too high. And then if we're not eating all morning, we're asking our body to run on cortisol all morning. Then what we're doing is we're having meals later in the day. If you fast all morning, studies show that your blood sugar response to your next meals, lunch and dinner, will be higher. Then we're also eating at a time of the day where when our insulin sensitivity is getting worse. So I already talked about that study, but our insulin sensitivity for people that I see with a very regulated circadian rhythm, it's much better in the morning and it worsens throughout the day. That means you're gonna have your best blood sugar responses earlier in the day and it gets worse as the day goes on. And I always say insulin clocks out after, sun, after sunset. So if you are eating at one and then again at like 8 p.m., mm -hmm. you're having this huge meal that's half of your calories in a day right before you go to bed. What are you doing? You're raising your insulin, you're raising your cortisol, and you are opposing melatonin. Now, instead of your brain detoxing at night when it's sleeping, 
you are digesting. You, the body's going to prioritize digesting first. Then you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, well, I'm not hungry because you're still digesting. Often that's a sign of low stomach acid. And then it's just, you are in training, to use Molly Eastman's word, um, you're in training your body to be hungry at those times. And so you feel like yes. you can't get out of it. So don't try to eat breakfast tomorrow. You're not going to be hungry. Move everything up by like 20 minutes, half an hour, little by little. Let your body get used to this new way. But I see a circadian rhythm aligned fasting where we're doing an early dinner or a skip dinner is so much better for your sleep and it's better for your blood sugar and it's better for your hormones. So you get this whole positive cycle. So, so many times people just need to switch that fasting window and it really makes a big difference for them. There are some people who are like- Especially for women, oh, I was don't you say, think? Because women do yes. much better with a protein breakfast, yes. right? Like within an hour Lots of waking of fat. up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And I, I just interviewed Angelo Keeley from Keon. Yeah. And he was saying like, you know, when you're, when you go overnight and you're, and you're, you haven't eaten and you, then you're fasting the next day, he's like, you have to understand that you are then being catabolic. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that whole time your body's probably tapping into your muscle and eating up the muscle. And he's like, that's not good. And so to your point, Danny, not only on top of all what you just talked about, you are also losing muscle tissue, which is your biggest glucose tap. Yep. Like... Yes. Do you think that happens? It compounds. I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, I mean, it's somewhere in the middle. I feel like you're, the muscle's not the first place your body goes for energy. I, I just think, I think that to Danny's point though, and I think what we all have seen in our communities is it becomes easy to skip breakfast. Mm -hmm. Right, it it becomes. A but habit. cortisol, when it goes up, that's what's making you so catabolic. Right, right. But mm -hmm. but but I think that one of the things that I've seen work better for people is at least to if you're gonna do a, a, if you're gonna delay your first meal to noon don't do it every day yeah do it once mm -hmm. or twice a week um, diet variation is a very very important concept when it comes to being metabolically flexible which is what Danny mm -hmm. this is your jam right it's about teaching your body to burn what you have on board whether it's glucose or fat and sparing your muscle mm -hmm. right um, but diet variation so that you're fasting, you're feasting, you're eating in the morning, you're not eating in the morning, you're eating it, you're never eating late. That's the one thing you don't do, mm -hmm. right? The one thing you try to adhere to is either you don't eat dinner or you eat that dinner, you know, ideally before the sun goes down, but, or at least the, the tricky thing with skipping dinner for, and we know this is socially, it's really hard, mm -hmm. right? Very, if you have a family. With a family. As a fa if you have a family, like, what are you going to do? Skip dinner with your family? Like, that kind of mm -hmm. sucks. That's like the only time we all get together. Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, when we're in the work day. Conversation at breakfast, right? You're having the... You can still you sit there. <laughs> <laughs> can you not? You yeah, you can. And what I've done... Can you go for a I've walk done. with the family after? Like, I mean, you, you can. can still be there. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm the one can, here without, you know, a family, but you don't, so. it's, it, it gets different when you have kids. And the I'm other sure. thing is, like, sure. I mean, you might be able to sip on a cup of bone broth, mm -hmm. which would be great. But all I'm saying is dinner's harder to skip, mm -hmm. but you can still do it one or two days a week, mm -hmm. just like you can skip breakfast, maybe one or two days a week, but you're not, yeah. but the, but the trick is not like what I see happening is that it becomes, this is the only thing they do. Mm hmm and then yeah. you, you're constantly driving that cortisol up, constantly living in that catabolic state. And constantly. not getting enough protein in because you're eating and too late eating and then anything. you're snackish. Exactly. And then people are like, and then they feel like they need to eat before bed because it, they feel like that's the only way they sleep because they're getting blood sugar crashes at night because their cortisol is dysregulated and they're, they're running on fumes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're eating one or two meals a day, you you are not getting enough protein in. Very well, hard. unless very you're hard. very intentional yeah. about it, it's, right? And yeah. I mean, you just interviewed Angelo. I'm going to be having a conversation with him. I think Danny, you too. But yes. you know, this is where essential He's amino great. acids really come into play. Essential amino acids are are a pillar, really, when we're using the um, fat loss peptides. But they are also yeah. a pillar with people with almost anybody who's not getting enough protein intake and certainly people who are doing one meal a day or two meals a day again I would I would argue the one meal a day um, chronic 
mm. adherence. I would say Especially once in women. a while, that's there's nothing wrong with that, but to do it all the time. But if you're doing that and you're not a person with a massive appetite, then as you guys said, you're not going to ne- get enough protein that day. So use the essential amino acids. Use something mm-hmm. to increase that, that intake. Yeah. The mm-hmm. variation is important there, just like you said, Nat. So if you're doing a day where you're just doing one meal, maybe the next day you eat three meals. And, exactly. you know, also talking about time of year, seasonality, it's much more biologically appropriate for you two in Canada, you know, to be leaning into ketogenic diets and and carnivore and fasting in the winter months when food was scarce and usually that's when we want to like stay inside and be warm and eat chips and popcorn you know like we want to do all those things but if we're talking seasonality we really want to be and this is something i have not fully nailed yet but this is my my goal is to really eat locally and eat the foods that are grown locally because that's the correct light code for your body. So we're getting in the light through our eyes, but also through the food. And that's super, super important because it reduces inflammation. The body's very confused and also not set up to metabolize foods properly. So when UV hits our skin, it changes our gut bacteria to be up, mm-hmm. to be better able to metabolize simple sugars. So if you guys are in Canada and you're eating the banana in the middle of February, it's really not appropriate for your body. It's confusing because it's like, okay, this is a signal from the tropics and there must be all this light outside and then there isn't. So it, that kind of stuff, I mean, you can go down all these rabbit holes, but I think that there are certain areas that people can look into if they are feeling very stuck and these newer concepts that are coming out, like, oh, eat local. It's not just to also support the local economy, which is great, and reduce your carbon footprint, which is great, but it's also the most biologically appropriate. So if you, you know, it is also more appropriate than to be eating, let's say, you know, peaches in Georgia during peach season over the summer. So then we can lean into those and then we can get that variety through seasons. And then we talked about um, menstrual cycles and that variety as well. It's also helpful to not be so ketogenic and fasting and all those things if you are still cycling the week before your cycle you want to drop your stress on your body during that week so you you, we don't want to lean into those practices so some other nuances Mm -hmm. yeah lots to dig into oh i know you know what's what's funny is as we wrap this up i'm everything that we've really talked about here today and that's at the core of it. And we even have a, we have one question that we didn't actually talk about, which was, we don't like the questions of what are you eating? What supplements are you taking? (laughs) Because, and what we've talked about here today at the, at the root of this is we're all individual. Mm -hmm. What, what's going to work for you is not going to work for the next person. And you know, like, who are you to judge on what anybody else is doing? Um, we got to really find what works for us. So if somebody's telling you, oh, you need to eat one meal a day and fasting is the best thing ever, like maybe that's because you are a 35 year old male who can handle that, mm-hmm. you know? So you got to find what's going to work for you and know that everybody, that we're all individual. Your blood sugar is individual. The hormones are individual. What peptides you need is individual. And so please, everybody keep that in mind. And if you are following somebody or working with somebody that's super dogmatic about something, that this is the way or the highway, then see that as a red flag because we all need to be looked at as an individual when it comes to nutrition and health. Agreed. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. All the things, bio-individuality. All right, my friends, thank you so much. Uh, This has been so much fun. I know we could have probably kept going for another couple hours, but hey, I think we gave out a lot of good content, so we will stop there. Should we say where we could find all of each other? Yeah, so let's let's start with Danny. Danny, where can people find you? (laughs) Um, I hang out a lot on Instagram. Danielle Hamilton Health is my handle and website, and my podcast is Unlock the Sugar Shackles, and I also have a new web... uh, YouTube that I have been loving putting content on. Amazing. And is that Unlock the Sugar Shackles or Daniel? No, Danielle Hamilton Health. Great. And Karen, you go next. Uh, So podcast is the Hormone Solution Podcast and website KarenMartell.com. Instagram is Karen Martell Hormones. And so I am also putting a ton of content out. Um, Our 
our podcast has over 300 episodes now, over a million downloads. It's 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 amazing. We've got so many great guests. Nat and Danny have both been on there multiple times. Uh, so you'll you'll find tons of information there about hormones. Amazing. And I'm Natalie Nidham. My podcast is the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. And you can find me on Instagram at Natalie Nidham and on YouTube at Natalie Nidham. And that's about it. Um, yeah. Awesome. That's it. That's all. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.